Okay, hello and welcome to the first ever webinar organised by the Journal of IP Law and Practice. Um, this is the inaugural session in a series that we're creating to engage with you, our community of readers and writers. I'm Sarah Harris, the Managing Editor of the Journal, speaking, you from speaking to you from Oxford. And today we have a wonderful lineup of speakers to talk about the European Union trademark. I'll now hand over to Dr. Eleonora Rosati, who will introduce the panel of speakers. But before I do so, I'd like to thank Eleonora and the speakers for their work in organising the webinar. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Eleonora. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, hello, everyone. I see that uh, many of you are viewing this uh, from different parts of the world. I hope that everyone is safe. And it is great to see such a, you know, a great participation to discuss today's topic, that is recent developments in trademark law. So I shall start by saying that this webinar builds upon one of our speakers' recent articles for the Journal of Intellectual Property Law and Practice. The author is Arnaud Foliar Mongiral, is <laughs> at UIPO and he's been there for several years. He's in the International Cooperation and Legal Affairs at the UIPO. Um, the article that Arnaud uh, uh, has written is published uh, as part of a um, regular routine. Every year we publish uh, recent updates on trademark law by Arnaud and uh, a co-author of his. And this article, like all the other roundups, are freely accessible for a, a few weeks. So please uh, do take advantage of this opportunity to catch up with the most recent trademark developments. Uh, we are also very happy that uh, we have uh, two additional speakers today who have uh, kindly accepted the invitation uh, to join uh, this debate. Uh, I guess that similarly to our no, they do not require any introduction because uh, they are uh, superstars uh, of uh, the uh, trademark and more generally uh, IP field. And uh, they are uh, Verena uh, von Bomard, uh, who is uh, the founder of uh, Bomard IP, one of the leading uh, trademark practices. She's uh, based in Alicante and uh, she's an author herself of several publications, including a very useful uh, trademark Bible uh, that is a concise uh, European trademark law, uh, which she has co-edited. And I think is uh, one of the mm, most useful uh, publications for those uh, practicing uh, trademark law in Europe. The other speaker is uh, Simon Malinix QC. Uh, he's uh, well known uh, to all the trademark aficionados. Uh, he has uh, been acting uh, uh, in courts uh, at different levels, including at the level of the General Court and the Court of Justice of the EU. And uh, he has been uh, acting in uh, leading cases such as uh, KitKat, uh, Spec Savers, IP Translator, uh, Interflora, uh, Budweiser, Intel, L'Oreal, Adam Opel, Arsenal, uh, UDV, DHL, and uh, also Skykick. So we are very pleased to have them with us today. Um, the plan for the session is the following. We are going to go through clusters of topics. We had the six topics to cover in 60 minutes or so. And um, I will share uh, details of these uh, cases with you after this webinar so that uh, you, are, you know where to find the judgments that we are going to discuss today. The topics uh, are, uh, first of all, uh, drafting trademark specifications after Skykick. Uh, the second topic will be the assessment of uh, uh, goods and services uh, similarity and complementarity after uh, the judgment of the Court of Justice uh, to Lallian Barlington. Then we will move to international trademark jurisdiction for EU trademark infringements after AMS NIV. And then we shall discuss uh, uh, lack of use, revocation and entitlement to damage compensation after Cooper. And then the final two topics will be scandalous immoral marks after the Facugete case and the protection of shape marks after the recent judgment in Gombods. So we have 60 minutes. Um, you are very welcome to ask questions and um, make comments. I invite you to use the chat box. So please do write your comments and questions there and we shall do our best to address them. Uh, I see that there is a participant with uh, the video on. I suggest that he turns it off so uh, that only the speakers are on video. 
I repeat, this meeting is being recorded, so please be aware of that. So let's start with the first topic of today's webinar, which is the Skyki case. I guess that for um, European trademark lawyer, the judgment of the Court of Justice was keenly awaited. And after that, not everyone was happy with the result. So I would like to start by asking Arnaud to comment on Skykick and the implications of these recent CJU judgments. Thanks a lot, Eleonora. Uh, <clears throat> just a, a regular caveat. Uh, this time I will be uh, speaking on my own. I won't be uh, speaking on behalf of the office. So I will try to express uh, personal opinions if I have any. Uh, and uh, I also wanted to, to, uh, to greet very warmly and uh, David Rogers, who is my uh, co-author uh, on this roundup, uh, and also my uh, EU IPO uh, colleagues. Uh, before I get too emotional on that, I, I uh, uh, yes, wanted to say a couple of words about the, uh, the sky kick judgment, um, which invites us to reconsider a bit the way we build lists of goods and services. Uh, until very recent past, it was common to believe that the uh, broader and the, or the uh, a list of goods and services which was worded in, in very general terms was probably the best means to achieve or to uh, uh, get at the broadest possible uh, scope of protection. And precisely, this is something which uh, uh, the judgment of the Court of Justice uh, invites us to reconsider now. So the facts of the case were relatively were complex, but I would try to simplify them. You have on the one hand the 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 uh, the, uh, the, the plaintiff uh, Sky PLC, who is a major uh, UK operator in the fields of uh, uh, television broadcasting, telephony, etc. Uh, and uh, the defendant is uh, uh, Skykick. Skykick is involved in uh, email migration or cloud uh, backup. Uh, goods and services, and that has nothing to do with the, the, the um, field of operation or the main field of operation of uh, Sky PLC. So on the paper, uh, they are not competitors. However, uh, uh, Sky, the, uh, the, the plaintiff, uh, is the uh, proprietor of a number of uh, national marks in the UK and uh, EU trademarks registered for long lists of goods and services, including uh, product or service indications such as software and telecommunications. So what happened is that uh, Sky filed uh, an infringement action against uh, uh, Skykick, uh, and uh, Skykick struck back by filing a, a, a counterclaim, uh, claiming the invalidity of the earlier marks on account of the fact that the list of goods and services uh, were unclear, were, or did not comply with the requirement of uh, uh, precision set out by the Court of Justice. And the second ground uh, for, for invalidity uh, was that Sky acted in bad faith uh, in, uh, in the sense that it had applied for a number of goods and services which uh, it had never had any intention to use the mark uh, uh, for. And um, the, I will briefly uh, 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 summarized the, the, the answers uh, of the Court of Justice. The first point, uh, th there were five uh, questions uh, asked to, to the Court of Justice. I will only address two. Uh, the first of one, uh, the first of which was whether the lack of clarity or precision of the list of goods and services was an absolute ground for invalidity. The Court of Justice replies in the negative. It says there is already an exhaustive list of absolute grounds for invalidity and the lack of precision of the product or service indications is not one of them. So this is not an absolute ground for invalidity, which is good. And on top of it, uh, well, this uh, finding is supported, says the Court of Justice, by the fact that there are corrective measures, and that's very important. Uh, the Court of Justice does not refer to the possibility that trademark proprietors have to restrict the list of, their, uh, uh, of, the list of goods and services at any time before or after registrations, but that certainly is something that proprietors may uh, envisage. But what does what the, the Court of Justice uh, does is to refer specifically to the revocation proceedings and paragraph 68, and more importantly, to partial revocation at paragraph 70. And the result, or the way I understand it, 
is that when you have a, a mark which uh, uh, covers uh, a product indication which is unclear, you have a possibility to remedy the situation after five years by uh, uh, requesting proof of use and then the scope of protection of such a mark would be narrowed down to the concrete goods uh, or services in respect of which it is used. So if you have an earlier mark which is registered for retail services without specifying the goods in, which, in respect of which the retail is, is uh, provided, uh, then the scope of protection could be narrowed down to retail of clothing, for instance, if the field of activity of the company is the retail of garments. Same thing if you have machines. Machines in the indication is an indication which is unclear, very imprecise. Uh, if you use the mark for pluffing machines, then you keep protection for pluffing machines, and this is it. So that's uh, the possibility to, to have uh, corrective measures uh, uh, is precisely uh, uh, something that supports the conclusion that it's not, uh, or the lack of precision is not uh, an absolute ground for invalidity. Now I'm mentioning the revocation proceedings uh, because there was an alternative uh, way of envisaging things, which was to say, well, you can never say that there is genuine news in respect of goods X or Y if you cannot relate those specific goods to an unclear indication in the original list of goods. And this is more or less what the general court said in a judgment which was adopted in 2019 in the Alliance uh, uh, case, in which the, court, the general court said, well, when we have an indication of goods or a list of goods and services which is so unclear that you cannot even understand what the protection uh, is about, uh, then you cannot remedy the situation uh, 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 by means of uh, uh, showing proof of use for uh, some concrete goods or services. That I think is a solution that does not square with the position taken by the Court of Justice and that does not square also with the need to recognize a certain protection for trademarks which have been registered with some product or service indications which are too imprecise. And why is that so? Precisely because uh, I believe uh, that the, uh, a result like this or a situation like this is a result of a shared responsibility, responsibility of the applicant because the applicant has primarily the duty of selecting clear indications, but also a uh, responsibility of the administration that registers a mark uh, uh, which does not uh, comply uh, with the requirements of uh, clarity or precision. And the result of a situation where a mark was registered with some indications which, which are unclear leads to the situation where I think the applicant cannot uh, bear an excessive blame and uh, the IP offices and also the national courts must find or must do their best to find solutions to give an effective and balanced scope of protection for uh, marks like this without damaging the defendant's rights. Uh, this is something which touches the scope of protection of, uh, of marks and which uh, Verena will, uh, will, will explain about the Burlington judgment maybe. Uh, so first point of the Court of Justice, it's not, or the vagueness of a term is not a ground for invalidity. The Court of Justice does not say whether the indication software was in itself too imprecise. Uh, if I may risk a personal comment, I would say no, it's not too vague. It is reasonably broad, we agree, but it's not vague. And as <laughs> Simon is smiling, uh, <laughs> I see you here. Uh, the, it's not vague precisely because uh, it, it gives enough indication about the nature of the product. Of course, a software can be software for gaming or say a software for accountancy. Software as such doesn't say anything about the field of application of the product. It doesn't say anything about its purpose, but I think that for the clarity or for the precision or the sufficient precision of the good, it's enough if you have indications regarding its nature. And I think this is a conclusion which is supported by the case law regarding partial use in which the general courts, we don't have case law uh, from the Court of Justice yet, but the uh, general courts uh, considers it a perfectly normal situation that you have a product indication which is broad enough as to cover a number of homogeneous subcategories which you define according to uh, the uh, uh, purpose or the area of use uh, of each uh, subcategory. And the same principle applies for pharmaceuticals, which is 
broad but not vague as it would happen probably uh, to software after five years again you have a scope of protection which is naturally uh, narrowed down to uh, uh, something more specific according to the, uh, the, 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 the destination of the products. So I understand that some people will say that the five-year period, the grace period, offers an immunity which might be uh, excessive and in particular defendants may consider that the immunity is excessive. However, what we have to keep in mind is that the immunity is set out by the law, so it's something that the legislator wanted, that the legislator thought was desirable because it is limited in time. And on top of it, the case law shows, or the case of, uh, Court of Justice explains, uh, that you, a claimant is never left without any remedy because the claimant always has the defense to raise about the uh, a defense based on the, on the bad faith. And this will be the, the second point I will address in this case. Second question, for, uh, that was the fourth question or third question uh, put before the Court of Justice. Is there bad faith uh, in applying for a mark in respect of goods and services, which there is positive evidence that I will or that I never had any intention uh, uh, to use? Uh, so the Court of Justice says, well, you can never exclude that there is bad faith in a situation where you can positively evidence, establish, that the trademark proprietor uh, didn't have any intention to use the mark and that his only intention was in fact to obstruct the competition on a given market by holding what the general court called a blocking position. Uh, I, I like this, uh, this uh, concept of blocking position which was used in the Luceo case by the uh, general court. Uh, more importantly, at paragraph 78, the Court of Justice says two things. It said, one, uh, the bad faith cannot be presumed, which I think is fair. Second, it cannot be presumed only because the trademark proprietor did not have any economic activity at the time of the filing corresponding to the goods and services which, are, uh, which were applied for. The thing which is a bit frustrating in the judgment is that the Court of Justice doesn't say a word about what could be an objective, co uh, consistent or relevant uh, indicia uh, which may support a finding of bad faith. And something which uh, you always uh, uh, read between the lines or that you might uh, read between the lines with this judgment is that the Court of Justice may have thought about repetitive filings, the evergreen concept, uh, and it didn't say so because the uh, matter of uh, evergreening was not uh, brought by the uh, UK uh, High Court. Uh, it is true that repetitive filings could be an indication of bad faith. Uh, first, because I'm not uh, saying it uh, out of the blue, uh, the Court of Justice said it before in the internet, internet portal case, uh, which was uh, uh, a case uh, uh, concerning the, the interpretation of the regulation on the uh, uh, EU top level domain, domains. And uh, the Court of Justice said, well, that the repetitive nature of conduct of an applicant may also be taken into account in order to assess whether or not uh, the filing of many marks would amount to bad faith. And in this case, a proprietor or a, an applicant for a, for a domain name had applied for 33 different trademarks in order to make sure uh, that it would obtain the corresponding domain name during the sunrise period. And then the Court of Justice said, well, it might be an indication uh, that it might uh, that filings were made in bad faith because he suddenly didn't have any uh, intention to use the three uh, the 33 marks. Another case which uh, this time is still pending but which will be interesting because it is uh, expected that it will the general court will give us further indications about bad faith is a monopoly case in case T60 or six uh, six six three slash nineteen. Case is pending and uh, a case in which a Board of Appeal considered that the mark monopoly, one of the registrations of the, for the mark monopoly was uh, applied for in bad faith. Also in respect of games uh, and electronic games, because said the Board of Appeal, well, the Board of Appeal based its conclusion on the fact that the trademark proprietor had uh, apparently admitted that uh, it was part of its filing strategy to 
renew or to refile the same marks on a regular basis in order to avoid being exposed to requests for proof of use during administrative proceedings, which is uh, cumbersome and uh, which implies uh, uh, additional work. So they said, well, one of the interests of having refilings made on a regular basis is precisely to avoid having to submit proof of use. Uh, and we will see what the general court says. If I may express a personal opinion again here, is that I have the impression that maybe the, the repetitive filings may be an indication of bad faith, but they might not be sufficient on themselves to establish bad faith. Uh, what I mean is that the, there's always a possibility that a refiling may correspond to a possible, to a, uh, a strategy and willingness to consolidate uh, a legal protection. And the, the, uh, the judgment in uh, Pelican, which uh, an old judgment from the general court, but it is precisely an illustration for this. And uh, in my view, uh, well, the, the general court will say, uh, more than the repetition itself, uh, what we should look at uh, is in fact a combination of three factors. Uh, one is how many filings there were. If you have 33 filings, as in the internet portal case, uh, it's a lot more convincing as if you have only three, four, five filings. Uh, the period of time over which the filings were made is also something which is relevant. If you have filings made over a period of six months, that amounts to extending the grace period for not much. If you refile the same mark every five years and a half, then it may be more suggestive of the willingness to circumvent the, the use obligation. And the third element, which in my view might be uh, relevant too, is the actual use which is made of the mark for the goods which are applied for, or for goods which pertain to, to a neighboring market. Uh, we will see in the context of the monopoly case, having in mind that the markets are actually used for games and uh, electronic games. These are the comments I wanted to make on the uh, uh, SkyKick case. Thank you very much, Arnaud. Uh, that was a very comprehensive and you also helpfully provided a glimpse into the future uh, or what the future might be like. I would like to ask the other speakers if they have any reactions, comments to what uh, Arnaud explained and also invite uh, the participants to share their own comments or questions in the chat box if so they like. Uh, Verena, Simon. If I may. <laughs> um, of course, without wanting to take, eat up the entire time of the entire webinar on this case, which it would deserve, um, I would like to add something. So, I know it sounded as if you were in agreement with the Court of Justice judgment, and frankly, I'm not. Um, but maybe I misinterpreted you. I think it was somebody said it was a disappointment of the century, um, and it was pulling the teeth of IP translator. One more step away from IP Translator. Everybody felt that IP Translator was a step into the future for the EU trademark system and and it's you know it's getting filed off um, on all edges and this is the final death. Um, in a way in Skykick what the Court of Justice said that you don't have to be uh, that precise and if you are imprecise but you have bad faith then you can keep what you wanted to use for so the worst can ever happen is that you get canceled down to what you actually wanted to use for. But until you get there, you have to have specific facts as there were in the Sky case, potentially. But that would be very hard to prove. Um, as we all know, it's, no, it's not easy at all to lead a bad faith case. So at the end of the day, everybody's stuck with very broad specifications that are out there for five years. If in addition, you can file only four or five times before you're liable for refiling, as you were saying, then, then uh, you can, in fact, monopolize, if you so want, the whole thing. And the one thing that I agree least with in the Court of Justice judgment, when compared to its previous case, there was this completely blunt denial that clarity and precision could have anything to do with the capacity of being a trademark because the language used in IP Translator, which referred specifically to the Siegmann judgment and to clarity and precision, and applying that clarity and precision language from Siegmann, where it was, of course, developed for the science, 
to the clarity and precision of the specification very clearly link those two. And in, here in Skykick, the Court of Justice all of a sudden says that has nothing to do with each other without giving any reason. And you and don't I think like that's it? not legal sound, sound yeah. legal reasoning. Uh, but on the other hand, well, if you if that had to do with the uh, with the uh, registrability or with the validity of the of the mark, uh, one of the consequences would be that you could never remedy such a deficiency. And, uh, and the, I think the court is being practical. On top of it, I don't think it is uh, uh, illogical in terms of um, uh, construction of the law. Uh, uh, but on top of it, if if we want to be practical, uh, uh, there is certainly an interest. Uh, for every uh, trademark proprietor to be able to remedy a situation which on the date of filing was probably not uh, totally correct by making a, uh, or applying for a restriction. And this is uh, something which uh, uh, at least is safeguarded in my understanding uh, uh, by, by, uh, by, the, by the Court of Justice. Uh, well, why, something... would you, why would you not be able to remedy that? Um, you know, clarity and precision doesn't have to be, I mean, of course, the game is over anyway, we don't need to discuss what would have been, no, but because... as you probably know, there are some very prominent members of the Boards of Appeal who also thought that Article 4 and 7.1a were the way of getting rid of these overly unclear and imprecise in my, terms. In my um, view, then, then a consequence would be that you could not make a restriction of something because you could not, you can never remedy uh, a, a requirement for the validity of the mark because the, the mark has to be valid on the date of filing and it's only in exceptional cases, maybe, uh, uh, you know, acquisition of distinctiveness post registration that you can remedy a situation which was not existing on the date of filing. Oh, well, if the, the Court of Justice could have fabulously said, of course, that everything I say doesn't apply to yesterday, which it has done for IP translator, although, of course, not in the IP translator judgment, only later in Lambretta and in Cactus. So it could have said the same thing again. So everybody with all their softwares and machines would have been happy ever after. But going forward, we would have had a clear incentive of being clearer and more precise in our specifications. But mm -hmm. actually, Sorry, if I'm, not, I'm not Eleanor, but but it's it's almost half past. <laughs> We're still talking yeah, about it. Discussion shows that uh, the issue is anything but settled. So great news for lawyers. <laughs> Let's now move <laughs> on to the next issue that uh, I would like to uh, ask you, Verena, to address. And it is indeed in light of the recent decision of, of uh, the Court of Justice in uh, Tullali and Burlington. Uh, how do you assess uh, similarity, complementarity of goods and services after this case? Oh my God. Yeah, and I already said uh, there's no way I can answer that question. And I'm very curious to see how the boards of appeal are going to try to answer the question. The background to that case very shortly was Burlington Arcade, a shopping arcade in London, certainly very well known in, in London and in the UK probably more widely, um, had a registration, several registrations for goods, uh, for services described as the bringing together for the benefit, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, for conveniently purchasing goods from a range of general merchandise retail stores. And this was in shorthand translated throughout the case as shopping arcade services. <laughs> and there, they held their Burlington Arcade mark against um, junior applications for the word mark Burlington by the German, actually in Germany, very well-known company, Burlington Fashion, um, for, however, not fashion, but goods in classes 3, 14, and 18. The um, opposition division granted the oppositions, however, the Board of Appeal disagreed with that and said that this very broad term was... Um, could not be compared properly to specific goods. So these very broad shopping arcade services couldn't be, there couldn't be made a proper comparison between those services and the goods of the later applications for the word mark Burlington and some figurative marks Burlington and therefore rejected the oppositions. And the general court, and I'm being very brief now, of course, agreed with that. So the general court also said, this is so broad um, that you cannot really make a proper comparison between these services and the goods. The Court of Justice didn't agree, and uh, I'm not going to make any secret of the fact that I disagree with the Court of Justice. Um, so what the Court of Justice said at first, shopping arcade services, yes, were to be set on an equal footing with um, retail services, 
So one had to look at the earlier Practica judgment. Remember that July 2005 judgment where registration for uh, retail services was allowed as a matter of principle, but you had to specify the goods to which that related. And of course here there was no such specification. And the Burlington EUTM, so one of the earlier marks, was in fact registered after that 2005 Practica judgment, so that judgment had to apply to it. There was actually discussion about that, and the Court of Justice didn't even address that, but it kind of, between the lines, you can read that it seemed to think that the Practica judgment should have applied. But then, it seems that the Court of Justice doesn't think that that needs to be settled, whether, you know, Practica applies or doesn't, because at the end of the day, the mark is registered. The mark is registered for shopping arcade services, and so you have to do the fact that it's registered justice. You cannot deprive the poor mark of its distinctive character, and therefore you cannot just say you cannot make a comparison. And it went so far as to not only annul the court of the general court judgment, but also the decision of the boards of appeals. It went all the way and took a final decision, which means the case now goes back to the boards of appeal, who will be tasked with the very fun task to compare shopping arcade services without any distinction, and by the way, without any uh, proof of use requirement for that, for the purposes of those proceedings, they are so old that this mark, although it was registered in 2006 for the purposes of the proceedings, was not subject to use requirement. So compare shopping arcade services on the one hand and goods in class 3 and 14 on the other. Um, it's yet to be seen how the uh, board will go about that. Um, it will probably have to answer the question because it could take the easy way out. It could have said, oh, I'm, I'm ruling on the earlier UK marks or I'm ruling on reputation and ruling, ruling on passing off because all of that had also been raised. But and we're, of course, coming very close to January 2021 and the reputation in the UK and passing off rights in the UK are unlikely to be a good ground for a ruling of the board of appeal, which means it's going to have to be stuck with having to rule on likelihood of confusion and the earlier EUTM. And I must say, unless they want to create a one size fits all, you know, register for retail services and you have it all, uh, they're going to have to get creative um, and say that, you know, you, if, if you do not want to accept that shopping arcade services cover everything, um, there is, you cannot say, you cannot conclude from the mere fact that in theory they could cover everything, that there is complementarity and therefore simplement, uh, similarity between our services and the goods. But I certainly don't have the answer of how they're supposed to do that. Arno looks very knowing. Um, this is how far I've, I've come to, I've, I do think that the, the office is going to have to look at its uh, guidelines because it, it is in the guidelines that, you know, vague indication of, of, for example, retail services does not allow a comparison, uh, which means uh, following this Court of Justice ruling, uh, they can no longer say that. Um, but how to go about the comparison without accepting that there is a registration that would cover everything, which is, by the way, very similar to what we just discussed, you know, software. In theory, software is similar to everything because you need software for everything these days and it's complementary to absolutely everything. Um, so if you want to avoid that, you have to get creative and I don't have the answer. <laughs> Simon, do you have the answer? Yeah, I don't have the answer. Can I just make a, a couple of observations? We seem um, in trademarks to be terribly concerned about existing registrations but only really when it comes to this IP translator point um, and lack of clarity. Nobody cares when it turns out that a mark's been sitting on the register for 10 years, but it should be invalidated on grounds of lack of distinctiveness because it hasn't acquired it throughout the whole of the EU. And nobody cares when someone pops up in a member state with an earlier right and invalidates it on relative grounds. But we seem to be terribly concerned that somehow uh, terms that lack clarity and precision should be allowed to stay on the register, potentially forever, being renewed in perpetuity. Um, and that there's some, there should be some sort of temporal limitation on the IP translator ro um, and practical bow uh, line of case law. I sometimes wonder what poor old Joe Sapp thinks when he looks at the register. 
because he looks at these terms like shopping arcade services or whatever it might be they are unclear everybody agrees it's unclear because it doesn't comply with practical bound but not only are they unclear they don't get invalidated and he's got to know when it was applied for because if it was applied for after practical bow it's bad <laughs> if it was applied for before practical bow it's good this person has to be more of a trademark expert than anyone in this virtual room and this is the kind of term that we're allowing to sit on the register and yet it seems to me that we somehow it, it seems to be born out of a of an artificial concern that there are many people who have applied for these marks and they shouldn't be deprived of their property but the fact is if they've got a good mark for goods and services properly specified they can reapply and they're very unlikely to be prejudiced by that so uh, I, I would just make that observation. Uh, if I may, I, I, I was talking about a, a shared responsibility, the applicant and the administration on the one hand. In this case, we have a shared res or responsibility, which is also shared uh, by, the, by the defendant. The defendant could have raised uh, or could have requested proof of use of the earlier mark. And that would have had the effect of narrowing down its uh, scope of protection to uh, arcade services in relation to so and so. He didn't do so. Yeah. So no, 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 no. I know. I, if I'm not completely wrong, it did request proof of use for the mark for the UK marks, which were arrested in 2000. But that was not but, That was not amendment. Not for the EU trademark because that was only registered in 2006, and it wasn't subject to you to proof of you, use you, for you, the you. purposes of those oppositions. What, no. they, what the defendant could have done, of course, Burlington Cash in that case. They could have turned around and they could have filed a revocation action, but you know they were trusting the fact that they would win at the end because the guidelines said that you know if you have vague terms you can't rely on them and Arctica stood against it and I frankly would have also thought that this language uh, for shopping arcade services was was not going to be considered similar to the goods. So wh what do you think? What do you think the board is going to do? When asked to <laughs> no, the, the first thing which I observed, and this is rather a matter of concern, is that uh, in January this year, the General Court uh, adopted a judgment in the Altispor uh, uh, case, which said exactly the opposite. So less than three months before the Court of Justice, General Court said, when you have an earlier mark which uh, covers a list of goods or services which uh, is unclear, it typically retail services without specifying in respect of which goods, then we cannot make a comparison and then the opposition is automatically dismissed. Then this is contradicted by the Court of Justice in this uh, Burlington judgment. How do we uh, handle it? Uh, you, you mentioned that the, the, the guidelines uh, will have to address this issue. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, how the, the guidelines will look like. Uh, on a personal uh, uh, note, I, I, I would say that it, it's not because uh, you, you cannot deny any scope of protection to the earlier mark. That does not necessarily mean that you have to uh, say that there is an identity of uh, the socks on the one hand and, re and retail in general. Uh, it, it is possible, but it is purely conjectural that the retail services of the earlier mark be offered in respect of socks. So if this is purely conjectural, purely hypothetical, I would say that it does not amount to more than an absolutely minimum degree of similarity between those goods and services, which you may always balance by the differences between the marks and the rest. The other point I wanted to make, this is for the identity. If you think uh, uh, that uh, there might be, for instance, uh, uh, a, a finding of similarity between tennis rackets on the one hand and uh, uh, sports uh, uh, clothing on the other hand. Now, if the earlier mark is not sports clothing, but clothing in general, would you find the goods to be similar clothing to tennis rackets? Probably not. So again, you know, the, the excessive generality of the... Uh, but I would say that the excessive generality of the earlier mark uh, or, or of the, the, the list of goods may play against the finding of similarity, sometimes. The problem, of course, is that sports clothing is clothing in class 25. It is clothes, it's identically comprised. And so I can see the office co clearly confusing those. Uh, at least I'm, I'm trying to find what would be a corrective measure again. <laughs> 
Yeah. Mm. So, okay. Something, uh, in respect of which uh, there seems to be no longer confusion uh, is uh, litigation uh, and in particular international uh, jurisdiction uh, for EU trademark infringements. Uh, the Court of Justice uh, ruled on this in IMS Neve, uh, and uh, I would like to ask Simon also because this uh, was originally a UK case uh, to comment uh, on uh, this recent judgment. Uh, Ah, the, the fact that this comes from the UK means that I take no uh, ownership of it, unfortunately. Um, this is a, 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 a rather surprising case. It's a case that's quite surprising that it came before the Court of Justice, in my view, because to my mind, it's a case that always had a clear answer to it. But the question is this. It's about website infringement. So when you have a, a defendant who has put on its website uh, the infringing sign or a confusingly similar uh, sign and it's pointing to your jurisdiction. In this case, that was the UK. Uh, is is uh, does the court of the UK have jurisdiction to deal with that, or do you have to sue in the member state where the steps taken to place the material online took place? So, in other words, the sort of uploading member state. Um, and put in those terms, it seems surprising to me that the case was considered fit for a reference. Um, because we already had a number of uh, judgments from the ECJ in the field of contracts, but also, of course, most importantly, the L'Oreal and eBay case, uh, in which it was made clear that it was the targeting of consumers in the member state that mattered uh, in order to assess confusion or infringement. In other words, it's the eyeballs of the consumer in that member state, if the website is directed to it, in the sense of, you know, uh, is it in the UK, for example, is it in English? Are the prices in pounds? Uh, does it, you know, adopt other, you know, does it have a local distributor and so on and so forth? And it's a fact-based inquiry. But the ECJ was pretty clear, the Grand Chamber of the ECJ was pretty clear in Laurel and eBay. Um, but nonetheless, um, the judge at first instance in this case held that uh, it was the, uh, what mattered were the active steps of putting the material online which in that case was Spain. Um, AMS was a company in the Uni United Kingdom with a trademark for the uh, figure 1073 for studio sound, st sound studio recording, mixing and processing equipment. Um, and uh, the defendants were Heritage Audio based in Spain, selling audio equipment there. And they had a website, which I think the judge held was at least in part pointing to the eyeballs of um, the UK consumers. And the question really in the reference was, well, do you look at the uh, uploading member state court or do you look at the, the UK, sort of the, the, where the consumer is based? There's a, quite a lot of complex background legal analysis relating to Coty Germany, uh, the Nintendo case, uh, Winsteiger and various, I'm not gonna go into that, I don't think there's time. Um, the key findings of the case were that um, you can bring an action, of course, in the place of the defendant's domicile. So if they brought an action in Spain, they could get pan-European relief. Um, but you can also bring an action in the place of infringement uh, or committed or threatened infringement as an alternative to that. And then you can only get national relief. And that's clear on the uh, face of the uh, legislation, EU TMR. And really what they held was uh, that, that uh, Effectively, the judge was, it was clear law that the, the, that the it's the member states where consumers are being exposed to the sign that matters. Um, they took a sort of fairly literal approach to the legislation, but then they gave a couple of pretty good, I think, pretty compelling reasons for that. They said it would undermine the effectiveness of trademark infringement provisions if you could um, effectively avoid infringement by citing your uploading uh, abroad outside of the EU, for example, and then pumping the, the infringing sign into various member states uh, and therefore uh, infringing. Um, it's often excessively difficult, as we all know, as litigators here, the litigators here, it can prove very difficult uh, to identify offshore uh, uh, remote servers, remote defendants and so on. So really what matters, you want to be able to say, is, 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 the, is the sign being pumped into the, into the jurisdiction? 
And then um, they really said that, of course, when it comes to the assessment of all the important conditions of trademark infringement, so adverse effect on the essential function in the case of an identical mark, identical goods, or, for example, likelihood of confusion, which requires an assessment of the distinctiveness of the earlier sign uh, uh, relative to the changes that are made in the, in the junior sign and so on. Of course, it's the member state where the consumers are based where that assessment should take place. I mean, who cares, for example? I mean, the Spanish court is not going to be able to assess the impact on the UK consumer necessarily when it comes to, say, for example, the word donuts, to take a completely <laughs> random example from another case. So we all know that sometimes uh, the assessment of trademark infringement, context, distinctiveness, and all that is best dealt with by a court that is uh, dealing with consumers. And the whole thing is supposed to be context-based, uh, average consumer-based. So this was, uh, I think, a reference that was only ever going to go one way. It was the right answer that they gave. It's a good example of the oft-maligned ECJ getting it clearly right, in my view. Um, Nothing to say about it. <laughs> I mean, you were very kind in avoiding to say that the whole confusion was actually caused by the German Supreme Court. Yes. Had the German, German Supreme Court not over-interpreted a previous Court of Justice ruling, you know, the German Supreme Court is really not known for saying nonsense, and of course it would be much to say that this was nonsense, but it was an over-interpretation yeah. of a previous Court of Justice ruling, and so the, so the reference was actually necessary, but as I think it, it, almost everybody bizarre. thought, why is this even making it to the Court of Justice when that was always clear? But, but that shows the low bar for getting a reference to the Court of Justice. If there's any sense in which member states are going in different directions on an issue, you're in Luxembourg, for sure. But in, in this case, it was a relief. It, it was a relief that the case was brought and it was a relief that it was finally decided because no, German lawyers now no longer have to say, oh, if you want to have an, you know, an, in place of infringement ruling, then uh, you have to use the German mark. And of course, they were all saying you have to file German marks now because you can no longer go on, on the basis of your EU trademark. Because with German marks, you could still go against those uh, infringements from out of Germany, obviously, only not based on EU trademarks. And that confusion lasted for like five years. So AMS need was a relief. Well, if I may, the, the, the confusion comes from the fact that the wording of the regulation refers to uh, uh, the, 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 the court uh, uh, where the acts of infringement had been committed. And this is the wording used in, in Rome 2. And in the context of Rome 2, the uh, place where the infringement has been committed refers to the place uh, where the first event giving rise to the, the, the tort uh, occurred. Now, uh, what the legislator should have used is the wording used in Brussels 1, which refers to the place where the armful event occurred, which refers both to the place of the defendant normally and uh, the, 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 the place where the, the, uh, the harm is caused or prejudice is, is, is done to, uh, to, uh, to a trademark. Uh, and what I also observed is that if uh, the it's Article 125 has not changed uh, on this account, Article 130 has changed. Uh, you, you, well, it's extremely technical, but uh, the first paragraph of 130 says uh, that the, the, the EU tr trademark court uh, takes measures according to its own law uh, in order to uh, prevent uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the future infringing use. And second paragraph, it says it may also uh, take uh, other measures, the corrective measures in the enforcement directives, such as destruction, recall from the distribution circuits, uh, etc. But then the wording was used was, again, uh, according to the law of the member state where the acts had been committed. So this uh, expression was removed now in order to avoid that the, uh, the, uh, the court which is seized will have to apply a law which is not its own national law. The principle should be that for uh, all orders uh, 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 prohibiting the use and for corrective measures uh, the, and for the alloc allocation of damages, the competent court will have to apply its own national law. 
I mean, the key just to come back on that, and I think we probably need to get on to the next case, is um, that the key finding in that regard was that they held that on jurisdiction, the EU TMR is lex specialis. So in other words, it's a special law on jurisdiction that applies to European trademarks. Don't be distracted by uh, some of the other concepts floating around in relation to the general law. I think that's what that's quite a key, key finding for them. Okay. Great, and then let's now move on to a different topic. Uh, um, a topic that uh, calls for consideration of different issues. Uh, so now we are gonna move into the Cooper decision and uh, we are gonna discuss uh, the interplay between a lack of use, revocation, and entitlement to damage compensation in the aftermath of this decision. And I would like to ask Arnaud uh, to reflect on the actual impact of this case. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, very briefly, an action, an infringement action is brought in France in 2012 on the basis of a national registration, uh, which was in the context of parallel proceedings, revoked with retroactive effects as from 2011. So the mark was uh, declared revoked one year earlier than the date of lodgement of the infringement action. And the question which was brought to the Court of Justice was whether the revocation of the earlier mark, even before the lodgement of the action, barred any finding that there was an infringement and uh, whether it also barred uh, uh, the possibility to grant any damages to the proprietor of the earlier mark if there was a finding of infringement. Then the uh, uh, Court of Justice said, well, uh, 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 there is uh, a period uh, preceding the uh, introduction of the, of the infringement action during which the earlier mark was still valid. Uh, and the, there was a period during acts of infringement were not yet covered by uh, the national law on prescriptions. So there was at least a period of two years uh, during which the earlier mark was valid and there were acts violating the exclusive right. And the Court of Justice said, it is true that in principle, you should make a concrete assessment of any prejudice goes to the functions of the earlier mark, but this is only, or that applies to the contested mark. You assess the manner in which the contested mark is used. And for the earlier mark, you assess how it is concretely used but only under the provision or under the condition that this earlier mark is itself subjected to the use requirement. If it is still covered by the immunity of the grace period, then you can never uh, 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 diminish its scope of protection. And this is what the Court of Justice said. It said, you can never have a retroactive effect of revocation which, which would have the effect of shortening or of depriving any registration of any protection. The, there is a minimum and incompressible, uh, I'm not sure this is typically English incompressible, but at least an irreductible, uh, irreductible period of protection of five years, which you can never shorten. So for this, you can have a trademark infringement, at least for a period which is not covered by prescription. Now, uh, the Court of Justice does not say that the national judge has to grant an order uh, prohibiting the defendant uh, to use the mark. Uh, and in fact, it cannot do so uh, because the Court of Justice already said in the judgment Nokia and in the judgment Levi, Levi, Levi Strauss that on the, if on the date when the uh, judgment is adopted, the earlier mark uh, was cancelled or was revoked, then there cannot be any harm done to uh, the, its essential functions, and therefore the defendant is free to use the mark, uh, yeah, even though he may have uh, to uh, pay uh, damages for past uh, acts of uh, infringement. And then precisely about the past acts, or uh, the uh, acts which were committed in the past and which were not prescribed, the Court of Justice says, well, the fact that the earlier mark was never used never used, does not preclude compensation in respect of acts of infringement, does not preclude compensation, but it remains an important factor to take into account in determining the existence 
and possibly the extent of the injury. So uh, now the, and I think this is the point that we, we, we were discussing with Verena before we, we had our, our webinar. It is difficult to, to imagine how the judge could uh, allocate any damage at all if the earlier mark was never used. Why? Because the enforcement directive tells us that the damages must be appropriate to the actual prejudice and that the damages cannot consist of a punitive uh, compensation. So if there is no negative commercial consequences which are suffered by the trademark proprietor, the earlier mark proprietor, then there should be no compensation and no damages at all. On the other hand, it's also true that the enforcement directive refers to the unfair profits which were made by the infringer, but that does not seem to be a component of the damages. It only seems to be one of the factors to take into account uh, in order to assess what is the actual damage if you do not have all uh, information, relevant information in this respect. Maybe the, 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 the correct solution would be to award a, a lump sum, which is foreseen under the, the, uh, the enforcement directive on the basis of the amount uh, of uh, royalties which the infringer should have paid if it had been uh, uh, authorized and if it had been uh, a licensee of the, of the trademark proprietor. And again, the lump sum could be reasonably low because if the earlier mark has never been used, then it has no economic value and there's no reason that a license on a mark which has no economic value uh, should give rise to royalties of uh, more than a token uh, value. These are my comments. Thank you. Any reactions from uh, Verena or uh, Simon? Uh, Arnaud, you also received a comment uh, from someone, I don't know whether you've seen it. Um, the question was whether all this will affect uh, UIPO's practice of requiring that the earlier right still be enforced by the time the UIPO decision is taken. No, uh, because uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, because the requirement is in law, you need to prove, uh, the, the law says up to which point you must show uh, the, the, the use of an earlier mark. It never says that a mark has to be used until the, the, uh, the, 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 the date on which the decision is taken, which is fair because you never know when the decision will be taken. Uh, on the intern, you know when the mark has been uh, applied for and you know when, uh, when, uh, when, uh, uh, when you file a consolation action. So you have those two, those two reference points uh, on which which, are, which can be objectively assessed and which serve as determining the periods during which you must uh, assess the, the genuine use of the mark, not later than that. Okay, so unless uh, Verena and Simon uh, wish to add something, I will move on to the next topic, which has to do... Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, you in the of time, let's move on, yeah. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, the next topic concerns uh, uh, immoral trademarks. This is an issue that has um, resurfaced from time to time in EU practice. Now we have a court of justice decision. And of course, it is a topic of broader interest because also in the US, the issue of scandalous marks was at the center of litigation, culminating with the judgment of the US Supreme Court in, in Brunetti, the fact trademark application. Now in Europe, we have guidance from the CJU in its decision in the fact you get a case. Um, where are we after this judgment? And what can we expect next? Um, in all brevity, given that we're coming towards the end of the uh, webinar, uh, let me say that this is a great judgment in that it reintroduces fundamental rights of freedom of expression into trademark law, including the law concerning the registration of trademarks. And it also stresses the burden of proof on the part of the EU IPO to um, have concrete evidence of a trademark infringing or falling under the absolute ground of refusal for a mark that is in, in this case contrary to principles of morality. The facts were quite, um, quite clear and it was in fact from a German perspective, so I'm German, quite surprising to be told that I should be um, shocked and find very obscene the title of this movie, Fuck You Goethe, that pretty much everybody saw or at least knew about 
more than 7 million people saw the first um, Factor Goethe 1. There was actually a Factor Goethe 2, which was similarly as uh, successful. It's a, very, it's a very fun movie, a comedy uh, from 2013 with a very uplifting message. And Factor Goethe actually appears in one of the scenes where a, a young guy paints a graffiti and he writes Factor Goethe, but he spells it this in the German transcription, F-A-C-K and then J-U, and then also Goethe is misspelled. So the most shocking thing in this whole thing is probably the misspelling of Goethe. Um, the Board of Appeal, um, together with the first instance, everybody thought this was terribly immoral, so fuck you cannot make it on the register, and no matter even if it's misspelled, and and without being able to you know go into great depth as to what was held by the Board of Appeal or by the General Court, the Court of Justice overturned both. And again, I, I get the cases today that where the Court of Justice exceptionally rules, gives a final ruling and annuls not only the General Court, but also the Board of Appeal and said that they had all gotten it all wrong. They, the, the, the Board of Appeal and the General Court had uh, disregarded actual concrete evidence pointing in the direction that the German consumer was not in fact um, in, in any way shocked by this mark or considered it as morally unacceptable. There was zero controversy in Germany over the title. Um, the movie had in fact been used by the Goethe Institute for educational purposes. The movie was open to young audiences. There was no mention even that this could be scandalous and even so on this abstract finding of fuck you not being able to be registered even though it's misspelled um, the mark had been held to be immoral so the court of justice reversed that and said you have to look at the actual perception of the public and this has to be based on concrete evidence which is great from the perspective of applicants and the but the most important statement is really that the freedom of expression is uh, referred to in recital 21 of the uh, regulation and it is, it is an underlying uh, principle of the entire regulation and it applies also in the context of registration and in that context to um, refer to what you just said Eleonora yes he too kind of reminded us of this lens and the fact decision which gave you know uh, the first amendment on the grounds of the first amendment and said that you couldn't whether in registration or in use, you couldn't just ignore the freedom of expression. So those two are the main messages from the Fakir Goethe judgment. Um, and of course, it will have um, increased the reputation of the movie, and I can only recommend it. It's been released in the US, so it's dubbed at least into English, <laughs> and it's quite fun. <laughs> And I think that uh, the message that indeed the freedom of expression finds its place in trademark law uh, was not entirely a given, no? Because uh, if you uh, look just at that recital, it only appears uh, third party freedoms, no? That you should not use your trademark to repress uh, third party freedoms, e example, uh, freedom of artistic expression. But this judgment is really interesting because it shows uh, that there is also another side uh, to freedom of expression that is the one of uh, traders uh, to choose the signs that they like in association with their goods and services, which I think is a welcome clarification. Um, what do you think, Simon and Arnaud? Well, I was just going to ask Arno to rattle off some <laughs> of his favorite refused obscene marks over the last well, I, I keep them years under them. <laughs> for, our, for our delectation. At my team. No, I, I, I was about to make the same uh, comment as Eleonora. Uh, the, uh, in, in the recital, it is said that freedom of expression should be uh, safeguarded for those who do not, uh, for the defendants. And again, only provided they are using the mark uh, in a context which is not in the course of trade. This is exactly what is required. Uh, uh, in the in this limitation in the now article 16 or whatever uh, so i find it a bit uh, surprising also what i find surprising is that account is taken of the actual use made of the sign uh, which goes contrary to the principle that you assess uh, the registrability or the validity of a sign irrespective of its use no i'm sorry i have to contradict that they don't say that you should take account of the use. And of course, the office had argued that if you allow uh, any reference being made to the actual use of the sign, that is 
like allowing uh, a quiet distinctiveness through the back door. What the Court of Justice said is you have to, when you consider the situation, you have to look at what is the actual perception of the average consumer or the relevant consumer, in this case, the German speaking consumer. And for that, to that end, what is better than to have actual use and an actual reaction when there was complete absence of any discussion of obscenity, when there was the uh, Deutsche, uh, the Goethe Institute that used Fuck you, Goethe, and the incredible success of the movie. It doesn't, it's not about a quiet distinctiveness. It's about showing that nobody was shocked. Nobody was shocked except for the office and the judges in Luxembourg at the general court. So this, they just said that you have to refer to the actual use of the, the surrounding circumstances for concrete evidence. And where there is concrete evidence, you cannot counter it by just making abstract and general um, observations. I, I love this judgment, <laughs> for once. <laughs> Great. Uh, let's uh, now move on to the final topic of today's webinar, also conscious of the time. And it concerns uh, the protection of uh, 3D trademarks. This is something uh, that, uh, you know, has uh, come up in litigation pretty often. There have been uh, several decisions uh, by both the General Court and the Court of Justice. And uh, now, very recently, just a few days ago, there was yet another ruling from the CJU concerning the GOMBOTS uh, sign. I learned today that this is indeed the correct pronunciation. So, so thank you, Verena, for that. And uh, I would like to ask Simon uh, to provide uh, an overview of where we are now regarding the protection of these particular signs and how the assessment should be conducted. Well, where we are now, again, is uh, another three-dimensional figure, uh, three-dimensional uh, shape mark running into trouble. As always, everybody's terribly concerned about keeping these things from being registered, and if they are registered, they should be removed. Uh, so this is another example of that. Um, it's gum, gumbots, as I understand, gum, gumbots? Gumbots. Gumbots. The gum, gumbots is a, uh, well-known and rather expensive toy or gift or objet d'art, depending on your perspective. It's a bit like those perpetual motion steel balls that people used to keep in their offices years ago. Um, and the case, but it's a different kind of item. I'll show you one, perhaps if I can share my screen, I can show you what it looks like if you haven't uh, seen it. Hold on, start share, Hope I don't show you anything bad. Can you all see that? Oh, not yet. What about now? Can you see that? Hopefully you can see that. Good. I'm going to start the video. Thank you. Start the video. This is one of these little balls. And uh, nobody doubts that it's quite a feat of design and engineering and mathematical acumen. Um, it's apparently inspired by the shape uh, the, the shell of a turtle, uh, its ability to self-write. Um, and uh, it's, I suppose, a bit like one of those toys that can self-write with, with sand at the bottom. But one of the key things is this is made of a homogenous material. Um, is it a trademark, <laughs> is the question. Uh, I'll stop that share for the moment. Hold on, I can just do that. Stop share. There we go. Yeah. Is it stopped? Yep. Good. Uh, and so the case raised uh, some interesting questions about graphical representation. Let me just turn it off. It's distracting me. Uh, graphical representation of shape marks, the interplay of uh, the trademark shape exclusions with design law and the scope and extent and manner of proof of uh, the shape exclusions, namely the technical result shape exclusion and the substantial value uh, shape exclusion. Um, so the facts were, actually I wanna show you the picture of the trademark now, just one second. I'll have to screen share that as well. I can just find that. Hold on, sorry for this delay. There we are. Okay, and I will share that now. This is the last share, don't worry. I won't do too many. 
Hold on a second. Second. Start share. Uh, where is it? Is it that? I think that's it. It's a sort of fuzzy black shape, which you might be able to see. Um, and that was the from one angle. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Good. Okay, I'm going to stop share. Um, and basically, this was applied for as a Hungarian national mark. So it was black and white, quite dark picture. It almost looked concave from one angle. And the referring court was troubled by, um, it, was, it was applied for as a Hungarian na national trademark, rejected by the Hungarian office. And on further appeal, the referring court was uh, made a reference. It was troubled by a few points. The first of them was, what is the extent to which you can make the assessment of any of these co considerations that apply, whether it be distinctiveness or particularly the shape exclusions, where you've just got one graphical representation, just that angle. Uh, secondly, could you take into account public perception about the actual product, like the thing that I showed you, the nice video and, and the reputation that it has uh, for being a mathematical innovation and so on? Um, and thirdly, what's the relevance of the fact that it has design protection, um, particularly in circumstances that, you know, design like patents uh, are limited in time and uh, they're very different, uh, whereas trademarks can potentially, potentially last forever and could, could effectively extend the monopoly uh, anti-competitively forever. And finally, how do you assess these technical results and substantial value exclusions? I should say that that's probably the least interesting part of the judgment because those exclusions, really, if you want to know about them, you need to look at the Lego case for the purposes of technical function, really. It's, it's all in there with a little bit maybe on KitKat in terms of the limited scope of it, and then Substantial value, it's the Hulk case, which has just blown the, blown the lid off that exclusion now uh, uh, for reasons I'll get to. But anyway, so the first question is, graphical representation alone, do you, uh, is the court limited to that rather obscure black and white picture, or is it entitled to go off and look at the product and look at the function of the product and say, well, that shows uh, sufficiently that there's a technical function? Now, I have to say, this, case, this uh, question has been dealt with in a number of previous cases, and they cited the Grand Chamber of the CJU in Lego, and it's pretty clear from that case that it's a sort of 360-degree inquiry, depending on the case. If you look at uh, paragraph 70 to 71, you can look, at, depending on the degree of difficulty, you can carry out a simple visual analysis, you can do, have a more detailed explanation, examination of uh, matters such as surveys, expert opinions, data relating to intellectual property rights uh, conferred on the goods. So I think the position is you start with the graphical representation, but you don't necessarily end there. It may, it may be that you have to get into many other uh, questions. Uh, there's one question that's quite interesting here, where they said, well, what about when the graphical representation only shows one part of the goods? And although it's not said in the judgment, what seems to be concerning them is that trademark applicants could game the system by potentially just showing one little aspect, not showing the rest of the product. And say, well, it's not technical. What you see there isn't technical, you know, and forget about the product and forget about all the other views and so on. Um, I have to say, I mean, they don't say that, but they pretty much say that you, as long as the graphical representation contains at least one essential feature, which is subject to the inclusion, uh, exclusions, uh, there, uh, those exclusions can apply. Uh, I have to say, I also think it would be most unwise to try and game the system in this way, because uh, it seems to me that looking at that graphical representation as it stands, certainly for other goods, it might be said that it is not clear and certain and would be subject to um, that exclusion quite apart from any shape exclusion. You don't know what it shows. You don't know what's on the other side. You, you're incapable of making the assessment. And if that's right, then it must be, or potentially runs into you know, cases like Dyson, Heidelberger, and these cases about, uh, about multitudinous monopolies. 
So that's the first thing. Um, the next thing is whose perspective do you take into account in assessing technical result? And interestingly, they, they sort of said, well, the public, you can take that into account, but they're not likely to have a very clear or defined view of what technical function is. And what I read in this judgment is that they seem to be encouraging uh, the use of expert opinion evidence, which makes sense for a product like that anyway, because, you know, um, quite apart from it being a rather beautiful thing that you put on a desk or something or play with a bit, um, you know, it's been the subject of, you know, uh, great uh, accolades by mathematics departments around the world. It's, it's one of the finest inventions in mathematics for years and so on. So it has a, a real uh, um, a technical side to it. Whether it can be said that it is exclusively technical or whether the aesthetic effectively overwhelms the technical is perhaps a matter to be left to the lawyers when this case goes back to Hungary. Then we turned to the... Um, substantial value exclusion of course that i mean that exclusion was basically rescued from well-deserved oblivion in the hauk case for years nobody cared about that exclusion it didn't apply nobody really understood it and it wasn't really used very much against trademarks but if you now look at what the court of justice has said in hauk uh these ideas of generic functionality, the idea that if it's distinctive, then the <laughs> exclusion may apply. I mean, you're damned if you do or you're damned if you don't. Because with shape trademarks, what you're always trying to show is distinctiveness. It is seen as a badge of origin, not just the article. It is seen a badge of origin, even though it bears a word mark. So you're always fighting against that. But Hauk says, oh no, all that evidence of distinctiveness shows that it has substantial value. So there's that problem with Hauk, and there's other problems with Hauk in the sense that it has made the law on substantial value, in my view, completely uncertain uh, and a massive pitfall for any trademark applicant in the field of shapes. But uh, they did little more really than repeat what was said in the Hauk case. Um, they said, for example, the value may be aesthetic, that's substantial value. They said the value may be mathematical, that may be substantial value. So pretty much anything can be substantial value once you have, as I say, blown the lid off that narrow, most people have thought, narrow exclusion in trademarks law. Uh, and uh, they've left it obviously to the, net, to the national court to decide. But they have pretty much given a, a steer, I would say, that it's, um, it's in trouble as a result of either being seen as beautiful and ornamental or, and or being seen as uh, sort of a mathematical in, in innovation and therefore that could be the substantial value. I mean, you can imagine, so, so, so basically, if you can imagine with this product, I mean, I don't mean to defend this as a trademark, it may or may not be a trademark, but the argument that you face trying to register this is it's not distinctive because it's seen as mathematical or aesthetic. It's technical, it's technical because it's seen as mathematical right and then it's substantial value because it's seen as mathematical and aesthetic. i mean you basically just cannot win in terms of getting a shape mark. and this this applies i would say to to pretty much uh, any shape mark. it's very difficult uh, to see how you can get these things registered as shape mark i know rno has expressed the view that when it comes then to the question of acquired distinctiveness for shape marks um it's very difficult to see how any shape mark can ever satisfy the burden of proof across the whole of the you know, member states of Europe, because you're always going to have a few gaps and it's always going to be terribly difficult that way. Anyway, I'm going slightly off piece just to continue with the and conclude with the judgment. They said that the existence of design protection was not fatal to uh, a trademark, trademark protection. In other words, you could have overlapping protection. That's an interesting um, point to make because the clear indication from cases like Philips and Lego where there were pre-existing patent patents for those products was that uh, this is a bit you know this is not to be encouraged to give them perpetual trademark protection when their patents have expired and therefore that was a relevant point uh, here the court said if it satisfies the requirement of trademark protection then it's irrelevant if it also satisfies the, 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 the design protection you've got to look at those two questions separately um, 
And uh, it also, it didn't matter that it was sought to be registered for ornamental items. That didn't mean that it was automatically excluded. So I think there are some lessons here about the graphical representation, by way of conclusion. Um, you've always got to make sure that you represent shape products in a very clear and certain way. Um, but in any event, the court looks like they're always going to look at the real product. And we think we saw this in Rubik's Cube, I think, as well. And, you know, Kit Kat, you know, there were, of course, there were lots of chocolate bars in court. You know, people can't avoid looking at the real item when they're considering the shape mark. Technical function uh, reinforces the role of expert evidence. And uh, when it comes to substantial value, as I say, it seems to have uh, been rescued from oblivion in Hauk and now seems to be the most powerful and dangerous, from the trade trademark proprietor's point of view, objection. Nobody used to know what it meant, and so we all ignored it. Now we still don't know what it means, but we can't ignore it. Thanks. Thank you, Simon. In addition to the, the excellent points you made, I think that this case might also have a lesson to teach in our, how we approach IP rights accumulation. Um, because now if I look at this from a copyright perspective, you might be aware that there is now a case pending before the Court of Justice, Brompton Bicycle, uh, which regards uh, uh, copyright protection of uh, the Brompton Bicycle uh, shape. And uh, the Advocate General has considered indeed uh, whether uh, the pre-existing patent uh, might have a saying in whether that article is actually sufficiently original for copyright protection. And uh, in his view, also the uh, intention of the author is relevant. And the fact that they applied for a patent suggested that they believe that their article was functional and not something to be left for copyright protection. So uh, very interesting. I think that this uh, Gombot's decision will have implications also when it comes to deciding a Brompton bicycle. Uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, Arno or Verena uh, if they have any comments to make uh, on uh, this topic and the relevance of the substantial value ground. I would very much like to say something about this case. I must uh, disclose, however, that I'm frankly personally in love with the gumbut. So here I have one. <laughs> I actually have one. I don't have to bring in my screen. Um, and I have been to an extent discussing the case on both with the lawyer uh, in Hungary and to the, the actual person behind this, um, the inventor, one of the inventors, Gabor Domokos. And so that has allowed me to gain a completely different perception and perspective on this item. Um, and so when it comes to technical um, functionality, I would like to say that my reading of the importance of the judgment is, is completely different from yours. Because you could have said, there's nothing new. It's Lego, essentially. But there are two things that are, that are in fact new. And one is um, that the the involvement of the gen of the public perception is only for the assessment of the essential characteristics, whereas the assessment of technicality, that is where the public has no say. And there the court says, and I quite like that, that this has to be judged correctly and objectively. And now here, of course, and you actually, you know, it's, it's easy to gain that impression that this thing is about self-writing, but it's, it's so much more and so much, so much different and self-writing, every holy poly can do that. You know, you put sand in there or whatever, that's not homogenous. You do not need that shape. And if, if you uh, accuse me of talking about necessity of shapes and alternative shapes, here it is, you can pretty much use whichever shape under the sun to obtain the self-writing effect. And this isn't at all about self-writing. So if the judge in uh, Hungary has to look at this objectively and correctly, it will not take into account the wrong perception of the public that this is about self-writing, which would be, you know, yeah. uh, of help. And the other thing is that in, in the Rubik's Cube case, the Court of Justice said that the essential characteristics had to be identified with a view to function, which was a completely, a suggestion of a completely circular uh, conclusion, namely that you assess which is the technical function, then you look which are the characteristics that are essential for that function to then conclude that they're the essential characteristics. And here the language is clearer. We're back to this two-step examination. First we assess the essential characteristics, then we look at what is the function, if there is a function, and whether they exclusively serve that purpose. 
And as to aesthetic functionality, I, I know you and the, Simon, you highlighted that the Court of Justice said that mathematical value could also be essential value. On the other hand, of course, this, the court says that substantial value can result from factors other than the shape, such as the story of the creation, the method of production, um, and, of and the identity of the designer. So yes, they can, essential value can result from those that are factors other than the shape, and they cannot be taken into account when assessing um, substantial value. So characteristics of the product not connected to the shape, such as technical qualities or the reputation of the product are irrelevant. Here, the court refers a bit to the Lubuta question also, you know, where it was said that the red sole is not, is not substan substantial value because it's only, it's only valuable to consumers because it communicates that it's Lubuta and luxury. And I think here this could be similarly said, if the shape nothing but communicates a great value that is way behind it, but it is not really embodied in that shape, then it's not a substantial value of that shape. So I actually think that there's a lot more to this judgment than one might think at first sight. And, um, and the gumbit is of course a fabulous trademark, <laughs> as it is a fabulous item. Let's see how it will, how well it will. <laughs> <laughs> Arno, did you? Can I say, no, the, the, about the, the substantial value, the court says, paragraph 42, characteristics of the products which are not connected to the shape are irrelevant. And at paragraph 60 said, well, you have a number of characteristics which might be relevant to the product, like the, the story of, the, uh, of his creation, the identity of the designer, but that's not relevant to the shape. And therefore, the, uh, everything that a, uh, we had a case about the uh, chair which was designed by uh, Charles uh, Eames or etc. The identity of the designer is not something that can bring substantial value to the product. Because it can to the product, but not to the mark, because it is uh, not connected to the shape itself. And uh, for, for me, the, the, the most important point is really the, about the functionality, where the court says, Court of Justice, uh, in the past, the general court said that the, the essential characteristics must be causal of and sufficient to obtain the technical result. Now the court of justice says, well, it is enough and sufficient that the, that the shape is causal of, uh, but it does not have to be sufficient in, them, in itself to, uh, to achieve the technical result. In this case, we see only part of the features which would be necessary in combination in order to achieve uh, yeah, the, the balancing uh, movement. Uh, but it is enough if those characteristics that are made visible in the graphical representation are necessary for the technical result to be achieved, even if those technical features need to be combined with other features which you do not see. In the same way as in the, uh, the Rubik's Cube, you have this rotating capability of the, each of the face of the, of the cubes, which will only rotate if you had this interior mechanism, which was invisible in the graphical representation, and the general court in a judgment, a recent judgment, said precisely that the characteristics must be called off, but they do need to be sufficient to obtain a technical result. I'm glad that the Court of Justice uh, uh, adjudicates on this point, even uh, before there's a, a further appeal in the Rubik's uh, case. Can I just come back? Can I just come back on to this one? The um, I mean, it looks to me like the technical function argument in this case is actually quite weak because, uh, to my mind, it, it falls within the court's case law that says there's a, an excess of aesthetic uh, aspects. To, so, so not all functional designs are excluded. If there is a significant aesthetic component, according to Court of Justice, uh, it should, it's not exclusively functional. Uh, I think Jeffrey Hobbs... Um, QC sitting as an appointed person in the, uh, in, the, in the UK IPO put it very neatly when he said, you're looking at an excess of form over function. You're looking at an excess of form over function. And so, for, so far as the functional exclusion is concerned, uh, that is, um, I think, a weak objection. However, I find it very difficult to see how they can wriggle out of the twin uh, vices of being either beautiful or mathematical, mathematically innovative, both of which are held to be 
potentially adding substantial value. It's without getting into the design story and the identity of the creator. I mean, it is a, an abs it's a very significant mathematical feat, this innovation, this design. Or, if you know that, if you don't know that, it's a very pretty ornament that rolls across a table and self-rides. And the question is, the problem with substantial value is it brings in aesthetics. Aesthetics is the vice. So once you once you allow substantial value to have this huge uh, scope, which perhaps I'm being paranoid about it, but once you allow it to have such a scope, it seems to me that that is the problem for the trademark applicant here, because either it's going to be seen as innovative mathematically, or it's going to be valued as a result of this aesthetic appeal. Very. Difficult. What else it is? What else is it? <laughs> well, you know, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> yes, beauty is a bad thing in this context. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, it, it wasn't it wasn't the design that was there first. It was a mathematical uh, uh, formula, yeah. and that was then sort of translated into this, which is only one of many possible shapes that can be created based on this formula. Um, to create these bodies and the, the mere existence, abstract existence of these bodies is the novelty and not this particular shape. Um, therefore, I think to say that this, this shape is the embodiment of mathematics and is the mathematical value um, is not stronger, at least, than the story of the creation, the identity of the, de the designer, if you so it's not a designer, it's you know, sci a scientist. Or the I scientist. think they'll need evidence of that. They'll need good evidence of that, I think. There is good, there there is good evidence. evidence. <laughs> yes. Anyway, of course, whether the, high, the Supreme Court in Hungary goes back into all these facts and questions, or perhaps lifts the, uh, the, the decision underneath and goes, it goes all the way back to the courts that can deal with facts, that's yet to be seen, that will be very interesting. And uh, my Hungarian is not good enough to follow that really closely, but <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> right, I think that after the overview that uh, we provide during this webinar, it is apparent that each and every issue could make uh, a one day long webinar in itself. So I think that now it is time to conclude. I would like to thank you very much, Arnaud, for both authoring his usual roundup and participating today. And I would like, of course, to uh, express my gratitude to Verena and Simon for uh, being part of this event. That is the first of a series of webinars. So while thanking all the participants for uh, being here today, I would like also to invite them to take a look at the next events and sign up, sign up uh, if so they wish. Um, so, Thank you everyone for uh, um, being part of this uh, first webinar. Uh, thank you Arnaud, Verena and uh, Simon and uh, thanks to all the participants wherever you are. All the best to you and your families. See you soon online no, also in person. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.